Hi, I'm Malika Bilal, and you're in the stream. Today, the standoff at Standing Rock. Native Americans protest a massive oil pipeline in North Dakota. This is all our territory, guaranteed by the treaty. And we are telling people that Dakota Act has entered into after entrance. The Standing Rock Sioux Tribe says the $3.8 billion Dakota Access Pipeline threatens their water source and sacred sites. The protests began in April, but recently heated up. Hundreds have joined the Tramp Tribe's encampment near the Missouri River. Now, police have made around 30 arrests and set up checkpoints. A state of emergency is in effect. Now, the pipeline builder, Energy Transfer Partners, says their project is safe and creates jobs. It's filed a lawsuit to stop the protest, while the Standing Rock Tribe has filed suit to stop the pipeline. Construction has halted as the showdown unfolds. So joining us to discuss this, Dave Archambault is chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe in the U.S. state of North Dakota. Kevin Pranis is organizing director of the Laborers International Union of North America, which represents pipeline workers. He's in North Carolina. Lauren Donovan is a reporter for the Bismarck Tribune in North Dakota. Winona LaDuke is a Native American activist and executive director of Honor the Earth. She's in Minnesota. And here in the studio, Simon Moya Smith, a journalist and culture editor for the news site Indian Country Today. Welcome to the stream, everyone. Now, for those of you at home, Femi OK is away this week on assignment, so I'll be looking out for your live feedback with the hashtag AJStream. So let's get started on my laptop, Simon. I have a couple of pictures that you took. Mm -hmm. Um, from the protest encampment. I want right. you to describe the scene for us as sure. we, we look at these and kind of describe what, what we're seeing here. So this is this first picture is people in, in canoes, mm -hmm. um, out on the water, mm -hmm. more people out on the banks. Sure. It's a demonstration to, to show people that water is the first medicine, that water is life, and that we have to protect water. Now, I think that when, when people look at this, it looks like people are just gonna go rowing for fun, but it's not. This is a way to show people that we're here to protect the water from the pipeline and those companies that would seek to poison it. So the people out here, what was that atmosphere like? Just describe what we're looking at here. Strength, solidarity. I mean, there's been more than 90 tribes and nations that, that, that have come down to the, to the encampment. I mean, that the positive sense and the strength that people feel standing side by side recognizing the, the sacred nature of water. I mean, when you, when you go there, you can feel the spirit, it's palpable. But I think one of the things that people are missing is the actual like friendliness when you're there. When you come in, I was fat five minutes into it. They wanted to feed me everything that there was. So <laughs> it's a very warm and welcome environment, but it's also one of strength and, and, and resistance that we're not gonna allow this to happen in our sacred territory. Warm and welcome environment. Dave, I know, of course, you were there and have been there uh, at the protest site, um, but there also have been arrests, and you were one of those people who were arrested, so it wasn't always as welcoming. Can you explain to us what happened? You know, right now we're getting, um, I'm going through court. The, the uh, pipeline company, and uh, Dakota Access is filing charges, so I'd rather not talk about what that took place with my arrest um, today. That makes sense. I can I can understand that, but I do want our audience to kind of get a sense of uh, why there were arrests. So I'm going to play you a little clip. This is from the Morton County Sheriff. His name is Kyle Kirchmeyer. He was speaking at a press conference in August, and he accused some of the protesters of being quote unquote unlawful. Have a look. It is turning into a a unlawful protest with some of the things that have been done and has been compromised up to this point. Uh, we have had uh, incidents and reports of, uh, of weapons, of uh, pipe bombs, of some shots fired, of vandalism happening in that area, and of uh, assaults on uh, private security. So Lauren, you've been covering this personally. What is it that you've seen and does it gel with what the sheriff said he saw? Well, certainly there have been uh, 28 arrests that we know of. Most of those were for disorderly conduct. 
Um, the all the accusations that have to do with pipe bombs and weapons, um, those have been. I would I would put those in the category of having been alleged by police. Um, none of those things have been charged. Uh, we haven't seen any evidence um, that those that there were pipe bombs. The Native American people there say that the word pipe was misconstrued or was overheard and taken to be a pipe bomb when in fact they were talking about their own pipes, their peace pipes. So we do know there have been the disorderly conduct arrests. Uh, more than that, you know, it's really a he said, she said uh, situation. Mm. Winona? On, on that subject, are you asking me? I, I was there. I did not see anything like that. A lot of people praying, and I believe that, you know, what they're talking about is that a lot of people loaded their pipes to pray. Um, but, you know, in the time that I was there, I saw a lot of people really caring and really concerned about the aggressive actions by the police and by the state of North Dakota and, and the energy companies. So I, I want to shift here just a little bit because our uh, online audience is uh, bringing us to the point on why the protest encampment is there in the first place. So here's a tweet from Old Crow who says this pipeline project affects the lives of people in North Dakota and all along the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. This is bigger than just North Dakota. So I want to talk about the pipeline project itself. Uh, here's another image just to kind of give our audience a sense of how big this is projected to be. So it starts here in North Dakota, goes down through South Dakota, also goes through Iowa and ends up in Illinois. Uh, that's the projected route. This is huge. Uh, Kevin, what's the purpose? Well, it was critical. The oil that's been produced in the Bakken region has been moving disproportionately on rails uh, for the past several years, and the rails certainly aren't equipped to handle it. Uh, it's potentially dangerous. It's also crowding out other commodities, creating problems for farmers, for everyone else who uses the rails. But most importantly, you're talking about uh, thousands of trains full of oil going through every major city and many small towns between Bismarck and Chicago, and I think that uh, replacing that with a pipeline that would put it safely underground is critical to do, and we've been working on that in Minnesota and in North Dakota for the past several years. So this is safer, I have to challenge that saying. a little bit. Go ahead, Winona. Yeah, can I just challenge that a little bit? I've been, I'm in northern Minnesota, and I've been facing four Enbridge pipelines and a, a lot of rail lines. Uh, rail traffic did go up considerably, but the fact is, is that today Bakken drilling is down by 85%. And we don't expect that it's going to go up anytime soon because it's super expensive to be out there. And all of the studies indicate that, in fact, you, you will have rails and pipelines. And you cannot say that pipelines are safety, safe because even the editor of Scientific American says that there's a 57% chance of a catastrophic risk. What these pipelines are doing is trying to put it out of sight and out of mind. And what has happened is, is that they're basically replumbing North America for the benefit of energy companies. Um, you know, we used to get oil from places like Venezuela. We don't get oil from Venezuela, largest oil reserves in the world. And now what we're doing is replumbing so that we got oil coming from the tar sands and, uh, and oil coming down from, from the Bakken. And both of those are ecologically extremely, it's called extreme extraction. It's extreme oil, high carbon, high environmental impact and high human rights impact. And, you know, in this era, it's not something we should be doing. I'd, well, I'd like to contest that. I think, first of all, there's no question that oil is moving regardless. And I think, you know, it, it certainly if it turned out that the Bakken went bust and there were no oil to move, I imagine the pipeline company would lose a ton of money. But I don't think anyone uh, in, who knows about the industry anticipates that happening. The problem has been that we've had, you know, huge volumes moving by rail. It's simply not safe. It's also not environmentally sound. You have the opportunity to fix that in a pipeline. And I think, uh, unfortunately, I think the protests have been somewhat misplaced. We completely agree that stopping spills should be a top priority. There are any number of spills that have happened in North Dakota. And the people at the forefront of trying to stop that has been our organization showing up to take on the contractors and owners that are cutting corners. And unfortunately, we haven't been supported by Hollywood celebrities. In fact, you have a pipeline just north of Standing Rock that went under Lake Sacagawea the only people who've been trying to challenge what was done with that pipeline, which wasn't installed correctly, according to the workers, has been our organization. So we are 100 percent committed to preventing so spills my, I and have protecting a, the water. I, I have a problem with I have a problem with the location. Every time any company tries to develop any natural resource, 
they know that the indigenous lands hold all the resources and when they when they start to drill or when they start to transport they look to encroach on our lands and that's our problem you know a lot of times uh, tribes are a part of this nation and and we do support economic development we do support uh, energy independence but stop stop doing it in our territory stop you going underneath and threatening our water uh, this tributary this this Missouri River is one of the only cleanest uh, bodies of water and left in the US but yet we want to put a pipeline under it and the geologists say that there's no there's a very slim chance that this pipe is ever going to break but when you look at what's taking place in Oklahoma we have a man-made earthquakes taking place man-made because of fracking that means the ground is going to shift nobody considers that and this pipeline is so close to us that when the ground shifts this pipe is going to break mm. it's a 30 inch diameter pipe it has 550,000 barrels of crude oil coming through it and it will break mm -hmm. and it's going to break sooner than later. So Dave, I hear you. I hear you saying it will break. I want to bring in a statement from Energy Transfer Partners, the people behind uh, this pipeline. Uh, they sent us a statement. So this is what they say. Underground pipelines are the safest mode of transporting crude oil. It's going to be monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. But I also want to show our audience this. This is information uh, gathered by High Country News. They put together a map and it shows spills around the country from June, uh, excuse me, January 2010 to June 2015 in the United States. You can see that there. Um, that's based on information that they uh, compiled and they found that there are about a thousand pipeline ruptures. So Simon, you see these two things juxtaposed, then what would be the solution? Because uh, trucks, trains, are they that much safer? It's not about safety as much as, so for example, what they're doing is with fracking, they don't release what chemicals, so there's like 700 toxins in, in, that, in the fracking fluid itself, and they're not releasing what's in there. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to avoid uh, an epidemic, a, a health crisis based on these, these, uh, these chemicals, these toxins. All we gotta do is go and look six years back at the BP oil spill, and we can see, we can see the trend of what happened. And we can see how it's affecting the people down there. They have uh, upper respiratory illnesses, they have skin diseases, there's cancers involved. So the problem here isn't about whether or not a pipe may or may not break. We know pipes break. So the problem is, is they're gonna go through treaty territory Fort Laramie Treaty Territory, and they're threatening the water and sacred sites. Explain for our audience Fort Laramie Treaty Territory. So the United States government basically said, okay, we stole all this billions of land from you guys, so this is going to be yours, and no white people will come here, and now there's a bunch of white people there. Uh, I, I see you kind of chuckle there, Lauren, and I know that you're close to this story. Is that what you're also hearing from people on the ground in North Dakota? Oh, well, I didn't mean to chuckle, or, or uh, it just seemed like an interesting way to describe a territory. Uh, in those terms. Can you um, repeat your question? Well, basically his point, though, is that the United States government is not respecting treaty rights. I want to share this tweet we got from Rebecca. She says, so many source their water from that river, not only the native population, and generally, she blames here the president of the United States, uh, but I would say others would go on to kind of extend that blame to the government, need to respect treaty rights. I is that something that you're hearing from those who you talk to on this story? I hear that a lot when I go on to the, to the uh, reservation and to the encampment and talk to people. Um, you know, I think, I think they look at it in those terms. I think it might be interesting for your audience right now to understand where this pipeline and the reservation uh, really meet. And so just to kind of lay it out a little bit, in North Dakota, the pipeline passes kind of at, a, at an angle through North Dakota. It passes um, the reservation boundary is bounded on the north by the Cannonball River. The pipeline itself would be about a half a mile north of the reservation boundary per se. Now, when you talk about the Fort Laramie Treaty, you're talking about a, a, a much larger historical area. And right now, of course, today what we're dealing with is a, a um, a reservation that has a very prescribed boundary. Mm. So this pipeline is not technically within the boundary of the Fort, uh, excuse me, Standing Rock 
mm -hmm. reservation. So, However, so let, me, considered let, me, uh, let me help you, Lauren. Uh, sure. There, there is, a, if, if you just go back to 1851, uh, we entered into a contract with the United States government and, and that defined a boundary. And a short time after that, 1868 treaty hit, and it shrunk the land base from our 1851. And ever since throughout history, our land has been taken away. There was gold found in the Black Hills. Once the gold was found, the Great Sioux Nation, who was all united, was broke up and spread apart. Uh, but we never lost the identity. We never lost our identity, and we never lost that uh, fact that we never were honored with the same protection that this Dallas, this Dallas, Texas company is getting today. Uh, the land that it's on was ours and there was an encroachment on our land. Nobody stood up, no law enforcement stood up for us and said, I, don't come on this land, it's Indian land. They I just took question, it. Dave? So I hear Kevin I trying to get in there. Kevin, Kevin, I want you to ask sure. a question, but I just want to share this tweet because it really sums up what Dave was just saying there. Uh, Haji says, it doesn't cross the reservation, but it does cross that 1851 treaty territory that's protected under federal statutes. Uh, Kevin, your response? Well, I guess the question is, you know, our members uh, participated, you know, throughout this process from the open houses to the public hearings that were held. Many landowners uh, participated in those public hearings that resulted in changes to the plan for the pipeline. Uh, so we didn't see any participation, you know, to my knowledge, from Standing Rock throughout the entire process when people had the opportunity, when it was possible to change and to me to wait until all the, you know, the equipment's on the ground, the construct the workers are working, right, the pipeline's under construction, and then decide that there are problems with the route, you know, makes it difficult for everyone else who really made the effort to participate in this. Hey, so, I want to say a couple of things here, because first of all, I've been, I'm from northern Minnesota, and I've spent four years fighting pipelines that are coming our way. I have participated in like 38 separate meetings with the Departments of Commerce, and and we found generally that the state blew by us. And I think generally what's known is that the state of North Dakota has very little regard for the native people and is quite in bed with, with basically the oil companies. So that's the first thing I would say is that it doesn't necessarily matter because tribal consultation did not occur in this case. The other thing I want to say is that I feel like, you know, what happened in, in the routing process is that they moved it from just north of the city of Bismarck to just north of the, of the Standing Rock Reservation. And that's really what they did in the routing process. So they put an environmental justice risk on people who already don't have enough infrastructure, already have some of the highest you know, problems of everything, whether it, whether it is diabetes, health issues, highway deaths, you know, lack of sanitation. That's what you're putting on the people of the Standing Rock Reservation. And I just want to say a couple other things, Kevin. I am all for labors. The fact is, is that if we would do the infrastructure in this country, this infrastructure in this country has a D. We have a D in infrastructure in this country, and you know that. But instead of fixing infrastructure in places like Flint, Michigan, which really needs the pipes, not the people of Standing Rock, we're not doing that. We're letting energy companies dictate the infrastructure of this country. And you and I know that the fact is, is that if you build infrastructure for people and not for oil companies, you have five times as many jobs in infrastructure for people as for oil companies. And so I'm all for you guys working. I'd like you guys to clean up pipes that are already there. I, I want safe pipes. I don't want to be endangered in any of our communities. And I actually want investments in infrastructure for people and not for oil companies. Yeah, we, look, we absolutely agree on the need for public infrastructure but and we've fought hard for great. that. But I think it's, it's also important to recognize that you know, no amount of public infrastructure will fix the problem of oil trains moving through Minneapolis, you know, Chicago, yeah, St. Paul, any number of communities. That whole, those need to I mean, be. The fact is, is that someone needs to challenge that whole issue because we're, you know, we are in a carbon challenged air arena. These pipelines are going to bring like 40, you know, um, you know, 40 million tons of, of CO2 into the atmosphere each that's year. Simply not what you true. need to do Th is those transition. Those are the same, the same CO2 from... that was already being moved by rail. And that's the difference. So then on that point, so I, I hear you, you Winona and Kevin, I hear you. So on that point, just for clarification then, Winona, are you saying that you want the oil to remain in the ground? Because there, there really is no want, carbon. I, I'm, saying, I'm saying I want a Tesla. 
I'm saying that a, a carbon, you know, I'm saying that a combustion engine in a vehicle is 16% efficient. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that an electric engine in a vehicle like a Tesla mm -hmm. is 65% efficient. Okay. And so what so, I want so Simon, is an efficient I want, I want economy. To bring Simon, in here then. Simon how realistic is that? How realistic is what? <laughs> the oil not coming out of she wants a Tesla. Well, no one wants a Tesla. Okay. Uh, the oil is Tesla. there. The Tesla. oil is there. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers knows it's there. Uh, got, uh, corporations know it's there. Likely, it is coming out. Whether it's coming out via pipeline or whether it's mm -hmm. coming out via uh, to then be transported on trucks mm -hmm. and trains. Right. Well, we have a dependency on oil, and I think that's ridiculous. I mean, the idea how much oil we consume across the globe. And I think what we need to do is we need to wean ourselves off of that and not build more pipelines to pull more oil out of the ground. More oil isn't what but, we should be doing. But, but generally in our experience, that oil is being consumed anyway. See, that's the problem with the picking pipelines as the target. I think to well, here's the invest in mass transit, to invest in things that reduce reliance on oil, that makes sense. But stopping a pipeline doesn't actually, in fact, most of the people protesting pipelines are coming to the meetings in their cars. That's, right? that's Their cars are no smaller than ours, right? Minnesota itself has products. a 10% reduction in the amount of oil we used over the past year. We keep reducing the amount of oil we are using. And you don't need to project this. And besides that, as I said, you have an 85% of the drilling is stopped in the Bakken. The Bakken is like, you know, kind of, a, you know, just hanging out right now because of the price of Saudi oil. There's no drilling and active drilling rigs in, in the Bakken. There'd really. be nothing to nothing worry new. about if that were really true. If ever, if ever, if everyone believed that, that there'd be true. nothing to worry about. If the Bakken were going to die, the pipeline would die its, you know, its own death, and the there, pipeline owners would lose so their. There's so much money. That's simply not the, the reality. Here's the problem, Kevin. That, that is the problem. So I, I hear let Dave me, trying me, to get in there. Dave, go ahead. Let me tell you what the problem is. Everybody wants to find a way, efficient way to transport. uh crude oil but when they do it it's a, a streamlined process it's a rubber stamp it's the the big oil companies out of dallas tech texas smoozing government officials so that they could get this thing done as fast as they can you asked me about why didn't we participate in the public hearings where were the notifications at you treat us like we're normal citizen of the state when we're a, good, a sovereign government and that state should have came to us and said, this is the plan. And, and this, it's all rubber stamp. Let's do a full EIS. And when those full EIS come through, you'll see that there's a huge impact to the environment. There's you know, a there's huge a lot of landowners detriment. who participated who realized that it wasn't a rubber stamp. It's absolutely it true. It is a rubber stamp. It's a rubber stamp. The EA was done before. The EA was done before it even came to Standing Rock. So whether we or not, that. so on that question, I, I hear you, Dave, and I hear you, Kevin, on that question of whether or not it was rubber stamped, we know that a U.S. federal judge heard testimony uh, in the, the Sioux Tribe's request to stop this pipeline. Um, an answer is due out September 9th, so we will see what happens. Um, but Dave, what do you think will be the result of that? You know, I thought it was really good that the, the judge wants to take extra time to look at all the facts. What we're looking at with just this injunction is that uh, they're blowing through beautiful land. And they're scarring Mother Earth, and they're destroying our cultural historic sites. And I know they're there. I, I have proof that they're there. Uh, but the company doesn't, ma doesn't care. The Corps of Engineers says we only have this jurisdiction on this one little piece of land. That's our jurisdiction. We can't do anything with the uh, state and private lands. But the state, the SHPOs, said it's all good to go. So the PUC, PSCs, Public Service Commission said, let's rubber stamp this. Let's have a hearing. When they had the hearing, they advertised in newspaper. We have a newspaper here called Teton Times. There was no public hearing notice in our paper. So as a sovereign nation, we're supposed to go and shift through other newspapers where Lauren writes and, and twists words. And we're supposed to try to say, this is what we want to see. This so, is where the public So Lauren, Dave Archibald, I want to hear Lauren publicized. respond to that. And she will in our post show. That's all the time we have right now. I want to thank all of our guests, Simon Moya Smith, Winona LaDuke, Kevin Pranis, Lauren Donovan, and Dave Archibald. Uh, and of course, to our community uh, for joining this conversation. You can continue to do so with hashtag AJStream. We'll see you in the post show at stream.aljazeera.com.
Welcome back. We're talking about the pipeline standoff in North Dakota. I want to get right back to this conversation by giving the floor to Lauren Donovan, uh, because uh, right before we headed into the post show, uh, Dave Archambault mentioned untruths in some papers and, and the media is propagating some untruths. And so I want to give Lauren a chance uh, to respond to that. Lauren. Well, you know, I'm not really sure exactly what Mr. Archambault is referring to. I do know um, it's, a, it's a difficult story. It has a lot of moving parts. Uh, we have the state of North Dakota. We have Morton County law enforcement. We have tribal authorities. We have people at the pipeline who come from various organizations. And so um, it takes more than one person to cover a story this big, um, you know, if, if like, we would try to be fair. I know we try very hard to reach everyone and be in touch with everyone and get comments from everyone who who should be uh, quoted. Um, if we don't always reach Mr. Archambault or uh, get the story straight, you know, we sure do our best and would be open to, you know, any conversations with him about that. Dave, does that sound good to you? You know, it seems like no matter what is said to the media or what we present to the media there's always a twist to it and that and that's what frustrates me uh the, what media does is it it tries to grab attention it doesn't try to um display the facts uh, instead it looks for a headline and so it's i i'm really cautious when it comes to talking to the media. So, so Dave, uh, I'm going to pause you there because, of course, we've just had 30 minutes of uh, time for everyone to lay out their points exactly as they want them uh, without any filter. Um, I want to go to another member of the media, though, uh, Simon, because yeah. you've been there covering this, but, of course, you're also close to this story. Yes. Uh, can you talk to us about what you've seen and, then, and, and that kind of shift in, in putting on different hats? So, and I've, I've emphasized this, that's, that's why there's a need for Native American journalists, because we know certain languages. When somebody says they're going to load a pipe, we know that's a chanupa, okay, and we don't run off with it, okay? And so a chanupa is? And a chanupa is our sacred pipe, right? So even in my column, I have no control over the photo editor, and he said that Native Americans were chanting. Well, just because a Native American sings doesn't mean we're chanting. It's a, it's a language. I don't know what the hell Luciano Pavarotti was singing, but I didn't call it chanting. So it's, it's about the language, it's about how we reference people. And I think, and, and I just kind of want to push back a little on something. Um, ju uh, I don't know your name, sir, the, the one that's representing the pipeline. It is Kevin. You were saying something about it Not takes... pipeline workers. Okay, so you said that it takes cars for people to get to the site, right? And that was, you said that earlier. Here's well, the thing. Well, actually, I've, we've, I've been through any number of protests and most and hearings on this, and most of the opponents come by cars, which Okay, is well, the only reason that we're in cars is because your people invaded. We'd be fine and still on our horses. So you're over here saying, well, you drive a car. Well, the only reason we have to do any of this is because you invaded. Your people invaded. That's the problem. So don't I, say, well, you're driving a car. Well, you're I, here. This is what we have to do now, right? Uh, that's, look, I, I want to start from where we are right now. I want pipelines to be safe. I want to avoid spills. Pipelines aren't we safe. All be we know for. pipelines aren't safe. We know they spill. We can see the people down there in, in the Gulf right now suffering because of the BP spill. Spills all over the Which world. There's a pipeline. Okay, but all over the world, we know that there's toxins in the fracking chemical. Fact, we know that, there's, there, that the crude oil is dirty. And when the these people, people get fighting, sick, the people where are you? To stop the, spills, the people fighting to stop the spills in North Dakota, that's our organization. The co contractor that built the one that but spilled it will the spill. produced water. Pipelines leak. Today. We there have plumbers no that fix pipelines the because they leak. There's a lot of about these spills. There is a lot of people worried about these spills. You've had uh, the Enbridge Company, which just bought into the Dakota Access, had 800 spills. Um, that's a lot of spills. You had a spill a couple of weeks ago up in Saskatchewan. The, the first people most impacted are the First Nation up there. And the Saskatchewan River, pretty much none of that oil was recovered. Marathon Oil had another spill at a pipeline um, down in Illinois, and they lost 50,000 gallons of, of diesel oil, and none of it was recovered. So I agree. We have an infrastructure problem in this country. Pipelines are breaking all over. I'd like the pipelines to be safe that we have, and I don't think we should have any new pipelines. I think we should be enlightened and move towards a transition. You guys should be on the job on getting all these pipelines fixed up now. You know, we got 60-year-old pipeline underneath the Straits of Mackinac. We got 50-year-old pipelines across northern Minnesota. We want them all fixed. We want them all fixed. Um, it costs five times as much for a company to do that. Instead, they want to just throw new pipe, and you guys are all about them throwing new pipe. 
We're we're the ones we're, most at risk for all the water. We're fighting on both both sides. We I mean all the pipelines, the old ones and the new ones, need to be sound. I mean there's no excuse for that okay, right, then, for not fixing. If I can just say one thing, then you need to tell the people to release what chemicals, what toxins are actually in the fracking fluid, so that the medical community can follow the trend. Like we can follow lead. We know the long term effects of lead. But if they do not release what's in those toxins, then the medical community cannot follow that trend. They do not know how to help that community. Somebody comes in sick. Well, what did they ingest? We don't know. They won't let us know. There's 700 toxins in the thing. So how is the medical community supposed to trend this over time if they don't release what toxins are in fracking when it gets into the water? But I think, again, no one's more active than us. I mean, though, we have workers who get affected by this. But we're talking about trying to solve those problems. So again, we it's would It's not about we solving the problem, man. It's about telling them to tell us what toxins are in those chemicals or in the so, fracking fluid. So on that point, Simon, I, I hear you there. And of course, uh, Kevin represents the workers, the employees. He does not represent the actual pipeline. But he can be the uh, voice. Come, they he, can say that, right? He you, can come out and say, release more toxins. You could also toxins. be the voice, too, which is, going and to I do me, that all the time. which is going to lead me to my point. I'm okay. glad you said that. This is a tweet we got from Nikki. She says, we, uh, I don't know exactly who she's referring to, so I'm just reading out what she says. We need to honor our treaties with our native peoples. What happens to them ultimately happens to us all we need respectful relations um, so Winona I know today uh, your organization met with the US Army Corps of Engineers do you think what came out of that will lead to what this tweet is asking for or, uh, respect of different nations well and honor in, in the treaties? case today that's right we met with the Army Corps of Engineers about the pipelines in northern Minnesota some of which are 50 years old and Enbridge another company is trying to replace with a brand new line and what we believe is that the treaties would require that the government speaks on our behalf and does not allow new permitting of lines and and requires the cleanup of the 900 anomalies in the present line so I believe that the United States government signed these treaties with my with my nation I'm Anishinaabe and I believe that the government should honor its treaties and that treaty would require that the government is responsible to the best interests of the Anishinaabe and other people and protects our land and, and natural resources. Can I also point something out that one thing that I think people are, are missing in this discussion, at least in the mainstream, if they talk about it at all, other than like the New York Times and a little bit on MSNBC, um, Native Americans are statistically more likely to be killed by police, okay, more than any other demographic. We are the smallest racial minority in our own country, okay? In our own country, we are dehumanized with mascots, right? We are de Native American women are 2.5 times more likely to be sexually assaulted, okay? And here we are fighting pipelines. We're getting it from all angles, and we've been getting it for all, from all angles for more than 500 years. So we're having to f pick this up this situation, this, this pipeline, and then there, I'm sure that we're gonna have to go, okay, we're fighting this, okay, but what are we gonna do? Over, okay, so we got another uh, Native American was killed by an, an, another cop. Um, okay, so what, what, what we, okay, we gotta spread out, we gotta spread out. So you know what we have now? Black Lives Matter came on to the camp. So we have a large community of people that are supporting Native Americans and only now recognizing that they nearly pushed us to extinction in the name of progress. Mm -hmm. This is that progress that they were saying back then, too. In the name of progress, we're going to take this land. In the name of civilization, we're going to do this. They've always come and said what is good for us. And it hasn't been for more than 500 years. Every time they wanted to come and take, 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 and tell us this is good for us, all we had to do was look back and see what the last thing, the last thing they said, the last thing they said was good for us. This pipeline isn't good. Did we lose your buddy? Uh, we are almost out of time, actually. You're going to be our last word. we scare word. him off? You're going to be our last word. No, his laptop actually died, and you need a laptop to be part of this conversation. I hear your point. I also heard Lauren. Uh, was that Lauren piping up right there at the end? Yes, yes, yes. You know, well, I know we only have a few minutes left, but I would be so interested, and I think your viewers would be too, if uh, Chairman Archambault, Archambault would uh, kind of take a few minutes and talk a little bit about all the tribes that are gathered at the encampment, tell us a little bit about the historical nature of having all of these tribes together on the Great Plains of North Dakota. Um, if we could set the protests aside, mm -hmm. I think it's, just, it's a remarkable, remarkable gathering there, and people are very interested in it, and I would like to learn more about it. 
So Lauren Donovan, always and ever the journalist. I love that as an injure question. Um, because we are running out of time, unfortunately, we'll have to get that answer online. But I do want to share with you, based on that question you asked, uh, Lauren, uh, things that people are sharing online. This is Ruth Hopkins. She shares the Blackfeet Nation stands in solidarity with Standing Rock in its opposition to the Dakota Access Pipeline. And there are more uh, organizations and tribes who are doing the same. You can see them on that hashtag no DA. PL. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have in this show. But I want to thank all of our guests for joining us today. Dave Archambault, Lauren Donovan, Kevin Pranis, Winona LaDuke, and Simon Moya Smith. And of course, a thanks to you online for joining this conversation. It continues. Hashtag AJStream.